I'm excited. Um, we're going to spend the next couple hours uh, together. Uh, my name is Chris Suarez, and uh, I've been invited uh, by your awesome leader, uh, Debbie and Patty, to come out and, and really uh, talk a little bit about um, talk about a personal journey in real estate, but more than anything else, talk about some systems and models and tools that every single one of us can, can use in our business, regardless of where we are in production level, regardless of where we are in time in the business, regardless of where we are in, in, in winning or losing or somewhere in between. Um, so anytime I have the opportunity to, uh, to speak to a group uh, and I can, I say yes. And that's because I believe that our industry um, doesn't do that real well. We do here in this office and in this company, but our industry doesn't do that real well. And, 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 and what happens is we wind up being a lot of islands in a really, really, really big ocean without ways to get from one island to the next. And I, and I think that was probably the uh, first six or seven years of my business, my career, was trying to figure this business out. And then somehow, um, quite by accident, I stumbled on a, a system and a model that uh, I could have been using from day one. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, before we start, just um, as a way of uh, um, show of hands, uh, how many have been in the business for um, about two years or less? Awesome. Thank you for being here. Truly, thank you for being here. About five years. Two to five years? Okay. Two to five years. Awesome. Five to ten? Very cool. Some of you don't look uh, old enough to be in the business for ten years. Um, ten to fifteen? Fifteen to twenty? Wow. Ten to fifteen. Awesome. More than twenty? Of course, Debbie. I was going to say. It's about a couple of us. Got, not, not us, but a couple of you. Um, I'm almost there. I am almost there. I was just uh, having lunch with Debbie and, and realized that I've been at uh, Keller Williams now for a decade. Um, this year is a decade with this company, and uh, I was in the business for about seven years before. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then we're going to jump in because um, Debbie looked at the number of slides that we're going to get through in two hours, and she said, um, and I said, we're going to get through them. <laughs> we're going to get through them because we're going to move really, really quick. Uh, I'm, I'm born and raised in New York. Many of you know that, many of you have met. Um, we have uh, actually an expansion organization, an expansion team uh, here in, in Vegas. Um, Lori was our, our founding member uh, of our uh, expansion organization. We, we thank you for being, uh, being the risk taker with us and we're continuing to grow uh, here over the next uh, month or two. Um, but it, we didn't start that way. I started my business um, in New York in Westchester County. At the time, and I don't know where it is now, but it was the third most expensive county to sell real estate in. Uh, it's probably still there uh, at the third or the second or the fourth. Um, but it was an incredibly, incredibly competitive marketplace. It still is in New York, right? We don't co-op in New York. We don't do a whole lot of things right in New York. Uh, but I love that state. I love that city. I found myself... Um, I found myself with my real estate license going to school uh, and um, interning with a real estate attorney because I thought I was going to be a real estate attorney. Um, all at the same time, I quickly realized that real estate uh, attorneys were miserable human beings. Um, <laughs> any attorneys in the room? Former attorneys in the room? Great. This is going to be fun. Uh, I've said that before and there were plenty. Um, but I just realized that it wasn't me. It wasn't who I was. It wasn't who I wanted to be. And, and that gr greatly could have been... Uh, could have been who I was uh, working for, interning for, obviously. But here's what I'll, what my takeaway was. In New York, uh, it's an attorney-run state, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an attorney contract. There's no broker contracts. It, real estate agents put the deal together. They, they write up a page and they hand it to the attorneys. And the attorneys then negotiate the deal all over again because uh, they have to make money somehow. And um, at the closing table, you have your buyer, your buyer's attorney and your buyer's agent, your seller, your seller's attorney and your seller's agent, your bank and the bank attorney, your title rep and the title attorney. You have nine, like you have nine parties. And I was the, um, I think I was tw 19 or 20 at the time. Uh, I was the guy that was sent from the title attorney's uh, office to orchestrate the closing. And so I sat at one end of the table with all these people. We can imagine some of our deals with all those people. Um, and I was the guy that wrote the checks, right? I orchestrated the closing, wrote the checks, and the most miserable people in the room were the attorneys, and the happiest people in the room were, were the buyers and the buyer's agent, and, and the sellers and the seller's agents, usually. And I thought, they get the biggest check 
and they're the happiest. So I am on the wrong side of this table. And, and that's how I jumped into real estate. I got my license quite by accident and uh, career path change and 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. Um, 9 11 happened at that time. I uh, had an office at the American Express building, um, which was the third building that fell. Um, I was house sitting that morning uh, in Westchester, uh, so I did not go to work that morning um, and uh, watched that on the news as I was getting ready. Um, and you know, there's going to be times in our life that we have these life changing experiences and, and, and makes, makes uh, you really wonder uh, what's the most important thing. And, and I really looked at my life at that point in time, looked at whether or not I wanted to put down roots um, where I was and decided um, that wasn't quite for me. So um, I stopped, I was selling real estate at the time. You can imagine what happened to the real estate market right after that. Um, but for the next about month, uh, two months, um, yeah, because that was September. Uh, for the next two months, I, I just volunteered. Um, and about November, end of November, that same year, I got in my Jeep um, because I was moving to Oregon. So clearly in my head, I needed a Jeep. So I <laughs> sold the BMW and I bought a Jeep and um, ended up eventually in Eugene, Oregon, uh, where I did not need a Jeep. It didn't snow a whole lot and it actually snowed more in New York. So you can see the thought process I went through um, to get there. What I will share with you is that started an incredible journey um, because I had about 800 bucks at that time and, uh, and no real estate license in, in Oregon yet and decided that I was going to do real, real estate um, in Eugene, Oregon. And <laughs> when necessity shows up, activity often follows. When necessity shows up, activity often follows. And I think that as I, as I go and I teach um, and, and coach real estate now, and truly it's my passion, um, one of the things I look for is necessity. Because if we can't find a necessity, um, then we're not going to find success. Right? Success is like one door over from necessity. And, and, and as people say, hey, what's the secret? Like, what's the secret of your success? Um, I would say first we need to define success and, and we shouldn't let someone else define it for us. But I, I think that my, my, my secret was I needed to succeed. I didn't have another option. I wasn't going back home. Um, there's some other side stories of why I ended up in Oregon. But um, all I will say, uh, since this is being recorded, is um, uh, 30 days after I moved to Oregon, I didn't know her anymore. And, um, and so I ended up in a... <laughs> I, end, I ended up in a town where I knew nobody, um, and I don't make friends easy uh, because I'm just not a, a social human being. So it's like, <laughs> what are you going to do in real estate? But I will tell you, um, there are some myths in this industry that, right, you know, you're successful in real estate when you have decades in the business and when you have thousands of friends and when you have this sphere, right, that fills a database. And, and honestly, um, it's following a model and... and um, and having some necessity, and having some necessity. Uh, $800 would do that. So I was asked the question, um, when you started, uh, were you full-time? And although um, I think, man, it is difficult to not be full-time in this industry when you start, um, can it be done? I would be lying if I said no, because I did it multiple times. I did it multiple times. So um, today we're gonna, we're gonna share sort of part of that journey. Uh, this is just a, a map of where we are today. And I'll be the first person to tell you that if you asked me even a few years ago, uh, would you be running a real estate organization in, um, outside of Oregon? I would have said, well, I don't even understand what that means. Um, so we're in an industry and a company that continues to pivot and continues to grow. And if nothing else, I hope we leave today with a, with a passion or a desire to continue to grow. Uh, but this is our experienced real estate organization. Um, that is the name of our, our real estate team. Um, I'll probably figure out a way to weave in a story about why it's, it's named um, Experience. Um, but what I will tell you is our mission as an organization is to build experiential lives through real estate. I think that real estate in our industry has a way to make our lives pretty unexperiential. Um, has a way to make our lives around a buyer and a seller and a transaction and a paycheck and a commission and, uh, and uh, everything else that comes uh, with real estate. But um, if we can truly build experiential lives for us, ourselves, our, our family, our loved ones and those around us, uh, it is what has really driven this mission to um, paint that country green.
Um, here's one of my favorite quote, quotes in MREA. You're going to hear me say MREA a lot. I see a couple books in your hands. That is the best thing I've ever seen. And that's the red book, right? It's our, it's our, it's our model and our guidebook for how to build a, a residential real estate career. And quite honestly, the guidebook to, to build any business. But one of my favorite quotes, and I shared it with a small group earlier today, came from Gary Keller. It's on page 36 of MREA. Um, and he said there are three things that are going to stand between us and success. And I would say this, if we, if we have to leave um, right after I say this, well, it was worth coming. Because there are only three things that stand between us and success in this business or any business or anything else we do. It's approach, it's your ability, and your willingness to do the work of a real estate sales agent. So what's approach? What does that mean to you? What do you think approach is? How would you define that? Whichever systems, lead generational models you choose to use to create your business. Yeah, it's it's how, right? It's the how and the what. And, and and can you change that tomorrow? Absolutely. Can you change it today? I could change it right now if awesome. I wanted to. Awesome. So approach is immediately changeable, yes? How about ability? What's ability? Skill set. Skills. It's skills. It's your level of skill. Can you change that today? You could level it up, but it might take time. Sure, but you can change your skill today. I guarantee you, I could change everybody's skill in here today. Maybe not everything you need, but some, yes. Can I change your willingness? No. No. No one can change whether you're willing or not, right? So some of us love like motivational books and motivational speakers, and, and um, I will tell you probably the, uh, the worst compliment I can ever get. Um, so listen, the worst one I can ever get is like, hey, that was really motivational. <laughs> like, I, 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 want, I want to be known as, hey, that, that, uh, your approach Awesome, I'm gonna do that. Man, I feel like I'm more able after, after listening to you. But, but I can't adjust willingness. We can't change willingness. In fact, you know, some of us find ourselves listening to motivational tape after, I guess it's not tapes anymore, but <laughs> motivational podcast after motivational podcast after motivational podcast. At a certain point in time, we just need to realize that we're just not motivated human beings. Because motivation comes from, like it's an internal thing. Uh, Brendan Burchard, one of my, a, a, actually a close friend, uh, uh, a, a client, um, uh, I view him as a mentor, um, in his book, uh, High Performance Habits, one of the greatest books out right now, by the way, I would read it, I would read it as a team, as an organization, we have multiple times, um, he says that we need to raise our necessity. When we raise our necessity, we're willing to do things we maybe weren't willing to do before. And what I would say is this, I'm a very, very average, normal human being. So from the outside looking in, people will say, well, like that, that map doesn't look average or that map doesn't look normal. If I can do what we've accomplished in real estate, anybody in this room can. Because it's not my approach, it was someone else's. It's, it's, it's I was willing to change my ability, but more than out, anything else, I was willing. I was willing to do the work. In our organization, we have this hashtag we use a lot, right, Lori? And it's called just do the work. It's, it, we hashtag do the work all the time. And, and the reason being, because if we just showed up and did that, we would be light years ahead of where we are today if we did the work around systems and models. So we're gonna talk about some of those systems and models. Gary also says this, that no one can live uh, simplified out as an industry, do we complicate things? Sure. Yeah. Why? Why do we complicate things? We think we need to. We think we need to, yeah. Yeah. Why else do we complicate things? Ego sometimes. Yeah, I believe part of it is us trying to convince ourselves why we get paid what we pay. We get paid. Right? We, we have a knack in this industry. Like, look at any problem. Do we have some complicated problems? Sure. Yes. We have some complicated problems in real estate. In fact, the best real estate agents are awesome problem solvers. However, the worst real estate agents find complex solutions to complex problems. And Gary says you can't live in complexity for very long. Lasting success always lies in our ability to find simple solutions to complex problems. One of the greatest pieces of advice that Gary gave us in a mastermind one time was this. The, the greatest business opportunity for any of us, think about this, the greatest business opportunity for any of us is finding a complex problem and creating a very simple solution to it. Think about any of the, any successful business today in America did what? Look at Amazon. I mean, that's just a, a very simple solution to the complex problem of where to buy food, hair products, shoes, underwear, like mints, 
Like it doesn't yeah. matter what you need or want, it's you can doorstep. find it and buy it so simply. Complex problem, where do I find that simple solution that is no different than our business. And here's what I'll tell you, like the more simple you get, the more successful you will be. And that's why I'll be the first person to say I'm a really simple human being. In fact, in fact, probably what I say most in my organization is we're having our conversations, people are like, hey, this, we should do this, and let's do that, and, and, and maybe we should do this. I will always say, is there a simpler way? There's gotta be a simpler way. Is there a simpler way? See, if we don't find ourselves saying that, then we could get caught in building pretty complex prop solutions to problems that we all face. Gary Keller said this whole idea of expansion is what? Some complex problems in our industry, yes? And he had hoped that MREA would solve those. Clearly, it didn't work. Why? Because we weren't, op we weren't willing to open up the book and implement it. It is a very, very simple solution to our business. So then he said this, well, some people have, right? Some people have followed it. Some people have built it. So what if I take those some people and allow them to build systems, right? Or allow other people to plug into those systems and models such that they can step onto that platform? Really, it's all about a simpler solution to the problem of being a real estate agent. Man, it's one of my favorite sections of the book. Now, what Gary says is, what's interesting about this is those that do, those, that, that, those agents that find simple solutions to complex problems, guess what they wound up with more of? Time. Yeah, and money came next, but time. Why? because they had, they had time to actually pursue their activities, as opposed to all the complex solutions that other agents had, and they spent all their time on those complex solutions. I, we, could, we could talk for an hour on complexity versus simplicity, but don't let that slip by. Now, what do you see in front of you? Model. Beautiful dress. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we all see something different, perhaps. But, um, <laughs> but and I wasn't, I, yeah. So, um, so for a minute, humor me. Why would someone refer to her as a model, right? She's clearly walking down a runway. Why would we do that? What's a model? We can have a deep philosophical conversation about this, too, and I'd love to. But what's a model? I have two little girls. Yes? Something to look up to, something to look forward to. Yeah, we call them a model because we say this. Uh, I wanna look like her. Now, I'm not saying to say that, but some people do, right? So what do we do? We go out and buy that beautiful dress and put it on. We're like, well, I don't quite look like her. So we say, you know what? It must be the hair. So I'm gonna do my hair like her. Nope, still don't look like her. Oh, it's my makeup. I'm gonna do my makeup like her. Nope, still don't look like her. Oh, I better stop eating for about 100 days. And then, <laughs> you know, we still, but, but we call her model Y because our society says, this is the model human being. That's where we can have a very philosophical conversation. I'd love to have that one day. But the, but the the interesting thing is, is when we say a model in business, what are we trying to say? Role model. An example. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Gary Keller in, 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 um, on page, actually I misspoke. The simplicity conversation is on page 27 of MRA for the record. The model conversation is on page 35 and 36. On page 35 and 36, Gary Keller actually quotes another human being in, in his book Unlimited Power. Who wrote in Unlimited Power? Tony Robbins. He quotes Tony Robbins, and, and, and Gary says that this section of his book actually changed his life, and here's why. Because Tony Robbins said, you know, um, as I look at success, people that succeeded did specific activities to achieve specific results. In fact, they asked specific questions to find specific answers. So as Gary looked at the real estate industry, he said this, well, there's gotta be a model. There's gotta be something to look up to. There's gotta be something that I'm willing to change in my business based on what produced a specific result. That's what we all should be looking for. In fact, that's why he wrote the Red Book. It is not a man writing a book about real estate. It is what he calls the Frankenstein of best practices. He went out and did the work for us, the heavy lifting, because none of us were gonna do it, and interviewed agent after agent after agent after agent, hundreds of agents, different companies, all successful. And what he did was put, to 
put together the best practices of successful businesses and said, well, here's the model. Here's what I found were the same key things in every single business. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. I tell the story quite a bit uh, as I teach, so maybe you've heard it. Um, I, I lived a very riveting childhood. I grew up in New York, and uh, making a living in New York is not easy. My dad was a copier repairman from the day he graduated high school to the day he retired. Incredibly hardworking man. I, I have my work ethic because of that man. Uh, he took two sick days um, in his career with Xerox. They changed the, the sick day policy after he retired and had about two years of paid sick day uh, um, <laughs> saved up that they had to pay him. But incredible work ethic, right? Uh, but my riveting summer vacations were this. Uh, school ended and we went to the hobby shop. I'm not even sure that they have those anymore, but that was uh, what we did. And we, we each of the kids got to pick out a model. Um, that was summer vacation. Um, and, and my brother and I would pick out a model, right? Sometimes it was a car, sometimes it was a dinosaur. Yes, right, we're there. And my brother and I were very different human beings. So we would get home from the, from the hobby shop, we'd sit at the table, and this was my brother. Love that kid. He'd rip off the cellophane, who knows where that went, open up the box, look at the cover, right? It's a dinosaur, it's a T-Rex, perfect, and just start putting the pieces together, right? Probably most of us in the room did it that way. Right? Most of us did. And at the end of the day, or the 30 minutes, that it took him to build that, did it look like a T-Rex? It actually did. <laughs> but, but why would it? I mean, uh, come on, there was a model. Why would it look like a T-Rex? Instinct. Yeah, I mean, we had a picture, right? We had this picture on the box. He'd look at it, he'd look at the pieces, and he'd glue it together. Now, I was a very different human being. Um, I was the kid that opened up the cellophane. I did it nicely just in case I wanted to put it back in the box or in the cellophane later. Uh, took off the cover of the box, put it in front of me, and laid out the instructions. I read through the instructions. I knew what the instructions were. And then I looked at the pieces. And they came like attached, right? You had to like detach them for those of you who have ever done a model. Okay. And right, I put them on the table. Piece one, piece two, piece three, seven, eight, <laughs> nine, 16, 27, 45, 75. Like it didn't matter. Like I put them all out, laid them out, and knew where they were. And guess what I did? I began to follow the model. I began, right? I began to follow the instructions. Do we have trains around here? I don't know. No. <laughs> that was scary. There you go. Um, I began to follow the model. Now, when I finished, did my dinosaur look like a T Rex? It should have. Yeah. Did it look better than my brother's? Sure. Every time I won. Every time. <laughs> it, it was a competition. Every time. Why? Because I followed a model. But here's the deal. We all have it. We all have the red book. But some of us open it up, take off the cellophane, and start gluing. And our, and our business looks like a business. Right? Our real estate business looks like a real estate business. And that's, and that's unfortunate because we convince ourselves that we're doing okay. When if we followed a set procedure, if we followed the rules, if we opened the book and read the model and read the instructions and said, this is what I'm going to do, I guarantee you it would look a lot better. Instead, I say, we've turned a model into a menu. We roll up like it's a fast food joint and say, you know what, I like page 35, I'm going to really do page 72, I'm going to take 115, but I don't like 15 or 21. Like We turn the model into a menu and choose the pieces that we wish to do. Who should I rank for you? Problem. Problem. Bring Gary <laughs> and thank him for the model. So what I will say is, when you hear the word model, please think about it differently. Please think about it differently. Now it's it's not easy, is it? It take it takes willingness to do it. Now interestingly enough, um, the models in MREA don't start uh, until about page 129. They don't start until page 129. So when I first got the red book, what did I do? I went straight to page 129 because I'm a worker. And I, right, I did, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. And I skipped page 129, right? Skipped 129 pages of real estate in that book. What's, what's on page 1 to 129? Misunderstanding. Yeah, it's all mindset. I call it the fifth model. I call it the fifth model. We have four models in that book, right? Economic model, lead generation model, the budget model, and the organizational model. The mindset model needs to get a little bit more attention because the first 129 pages, Gary went out and interviewed people and realized that guess what? They thought the same way too. They thought in a certain way. And interestingly enough, right, the nine ways the MRA thinks one of the greatest sections of the book 
and yet we, I skipped over it for years. And I wondered why my other four models weren't working well. Uh, what I'll say, and we won't spend a whole lot of time there, but the, the nine ways the MREA thinks, it starts on page 71. And the first two are foundational and the next seven are, are supportive. But if we nail the first two, we are well on our way to building a phenomenal business and a model. What's the first one, anyone know? The, the, uh, the nine ways the MREA thinks. The first way that they think, think powered by a big why. Okay. You agent. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Think powered by a big why. Man, some of us are like 10 years in and think, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's, a, there's an awesome conversation in that book that I share anytime I can. It's on page 74 of MREA. It's a conversation where an agent, and I'm gonna share something personal, that an agent went to Gary Keller and said, hey Gary, like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you still working? Like, why do you want all this money? And Gary looked at him and said, what do you mean? And he goes, you don't need to work anymore. You have plenty of money. Like, why, why do you want all this money? And Gary said, with all due respect, I don't work for money. You, however, do. And the agent said, no, no, look at me, Gary, I don't work for money, right? I need about 120 grand a year, like I'm good with that. I make that every single year and I'm good. Now, when I first started reading that conversation and then to hear Gary tell it multiple times is an interesting place for me because I was that guy and probably most of us are that we tell ourselves that we don't do this for money. I, don't, I love what I do. Anyone feel that way? We're not doing it for money, we love what we do. We show up and we enjoy it and we're not doing it for money. And then he said, you know, unbeknownst to you, you might be working for money. Look at your income. Year after year after year, your income's the same. So what does that mean? Whether you want to say it or not, you're working for money. You're working for a set amount of money. In fact, if you were working to be better at what you do day in and day out, year in and year out, wouldn't you make more? Mm -hmm. By nature, the fact that you're getting better you, you would make more. In fact, as I read that, I felt condemned because guess what? I was the guy that always said I wouldn't work for money. But I showed up to this company after about five years in a row of hitting the same production, right? Making the same amount of money. I will tell you, way more than a 21-year-old needed or a 22-year-old needed or a 26-year-old needed. But there was something in me that wondered, like, why am I not getting better? Guess what? The reason was I was working for money. I was not working for a big why. And as, as guess what, was I getting better? Yeah, one year it took me to December to make that money. The next year it took me to November to make that money. The next year it might have, made have, might have taken till October to make that money. I was getting better and unbeknownst to me at some point in time in the year, guess what I was doing? Taking my foot off the gas, why? Because I'm getting there, I'm closer. I'm gonna make my money that I need to. Be careful that we're not working for money. Because I will tell you, if you are, no one will ever do this, the, no one will ever set up the systems, the tools, the models, the, 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 the difficult work it takes. Why? Because you can make money easy in this business. So if you work for money, you will, day in, day out, year in, year out. That's the first way that MREA thought. Man, I wish I read that earlier. <laughs> the second way, they thought was they think in big they think in terms of big models and big goals now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, models and goals and systems and goals but Gary said the, those millionaire real estate agents thought big models and big goals their business could grow to any size because they thought about big models they had goals but what do they have big models thought models and goals I'm gonna go through the seven support now if you just master those two, if you show up and every day ask yourself, do I think this way? Do I think this way? Interestingly enough, I'd go to that page, page 72 of MREA, photocopy it and put it on your wall. And when you show up every morning, say, hey, do I think like an MREA thinks? Because if we don't, we're not gonna get there. It, it's a Frankenstein of best practices. Those MREAs thought this way. It was, it was weaved in their mindset of all these agents. So I can't just do the models that they did. I need to think how they thought. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the model too. Interestingly enough, the next seven are supportive. Number three is think possibilities. Number four, and you don't have to write these down, but think action. Now, think action's a good one because think action's on page 84. And Gary said this, this is one of the biggest issues in our industry. Why? Because we as real estate agents 
like to gather all the information that we need, right? And we, we have gathered everything we need to be successful, and then what do we do? Sit on it. We think about it some more. Yeah, we think about it some more. We, uh, well, the flyer's not quite right. That message, maybe I should tweak it. I don't like where that, that line's yellow and not white. Like, we think about it some more. What he realized is the agents that were successful thought action. They got into action and they did that very, very quickly. Number five is think without fear. Number six is think progress. Number seven is think competitively and strategically. Uh, are there certain agents when you hear the word competitive and strategic that you think about? Probably, right? They probably walk competitively. They probably walk strategically. Like you just know they show up and they're there to do something. Is that you? MREAs do. Right? And that doesn't mean competitive in a, in a negative way. It means they just show up and they think competitively. They're strategic in how they show up. Number eight and nine are two of my favorite because um, this goes to the myths that, that someone mentioned were in those pages as well. And it's think service and think standards. I love that. Because what that meant is those agents that had the biggest businesses, they woke up every single day and what did they think about? Service. They thought about standards and they thought about executing that service and standards regardless of how big their business was. Those are the nine ways a millionaire real estate agent thinks before you ever get to a model. Now, um, one of my favorite conversations right now to have with uh, real estate agents or business owners is this conversation of goals versus systems. Goals versus systems. What do you think is what do you think is most important, a goal or a system? System, just a goal. Mm. I love that. So we have some people that think goals are most important. We have some people that think systems are most important. So let's define both. What's a goal? It's your target. Yeah, it's where you want to go, right? The target that you set for yourself. And what's a system? How, How you get there. there. How you implement it. A strategic approach to something. Procedure. Yeah, a it's a procedure. It's how you get there. Right, it's, a, it's, a, it's right, the path that you follow. Um, I'm gonna give you three examples. All of, all of which typically have, these people have goals and systems. Uh, a coach, um, there's a new sports team in town, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the goal of that coach, do you think? To win, I hope. So. Yeah, I hope so. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't to win the cup, or if it wasn't to win the championship, would you want them as your team's coach? No, so their goal is the cup. What's, what's his or her system? Practice. His practice, his training. It's what they do day in and day out. Yeah. It's, it's the system that his playbook says to run, yes? Mm -hmm. And do they show up every day and practice that? They do that system. Mm -hmm. Yep, so the goal, championship. System, practice, day in, day out. It's the playbook. Um, Writers, writers, any writers in the room? Writers have a goal. What's, what's an ultimate goal of a writer? To write a Published. book, right? To get a book published, perhaps. What's their system? The journaling, <laughs> editing. Yeah, it's, it's writing every day. Yeah. I'll tell you, right? You know, Brendan's system is he writes every day. And, and, and they have, well, I'm gonna write this many pages, or I'm gonna write this many chapters, I'm gonna write this many words. Each writer has a different system. Hemingway had a phenomenal system, by the way. Research that, right, what he did. You know, he never ended a sentence at the end of the day. He always ended his, one of the most prolific, best writers of, of, in, in, of any time, right? He always ended midstream mm -hmm. because he would pick up midstream the next day. It was his flow. I think that's pretty interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So don't waste 4 to 5 p.m. in our world. Stay in flow and pick up. Anyway, writers have a system, right? It's what they do day in, day out. How about runners? What's the runner's goal? To run a marathon. marathon. Any marathon runners in the room? It's too hot, clearly, in Vegas to run. Okay. <laughs> this landed poorly earlier, too. I mean, yeah, over two here. How um, Higdon Higden training, increase it incrementally daily. Yeah. So if your goal is to run a marathon, I guarantee you, you're going to have some weekly training, yes? Oh, yeah. Right? It's how many miles do I run week one, week two, week three, week four, right? You're growing into that marathon so that when you show up, you don't die. <laughs> So as you think about that, what's more important, the goal or the system? See, I would argue that regardless of the goal, if you showed up and followed that system, guess what? Those players, they're gonna end up at that championship if they follow that playbook. The writer, they may not, they may not even wanna write a book, but if they followed a system of writing, guess what? 
One day they're going to look up and say, hey, the book is done. I'll tell you my story of running, right? Uh, my wife and my wife got into running. My wife got into running uh, and she signed up uh, for the half marathon, right? And so I said, well, I'm not going to sign up for that because that's not my goal, but that's yours and I'm going to support it. I'm going to run with you. And we follow the same practice, right? The, the same schedule. Well, she got injured a couple months before. Mm -hmm. It's already signed up. Registration's there. Do you want to do it? Well, not really, but I guess I will. I'm already trained and practiced for it. Was that my goal? Mm -hmm. No, but I had followed a system so that I could step in and run a marathon at a minute's notice. Isn't that interesting? What's more important, a goal or a system? You're still going to get there if you follow a system. But what do we talk about? What do we talk more about? The goal. Oh, yeah. The goal. Oh my goodness. November, it's goal month. Goal? December, it's goal month. January, it's goal month. <laughs> February, it's goal month. We talk about goals all the time, every day. and we don't spend enough time looking at the system okay. that we're implementing to put in place. There's three things that a writer wrote I'm going to share with you. Number one, um, actually, yeah. Here, here are the issues with goals. Number one, goals reduce your current happiness. Why? Because you constantly feel like you're let down. If you don't meet them, you'll be sad. Here's what happens. Yeah. Goals ultimately tell us we're not quite there. Goals can, and I'm not saying do not set goals. Please don't leave here. I'm like, I'm not doing a goal setting. But goals ultimately can make you feel like, hey, I have not yet arrived. When I get that, then I'll be cool. Like when I get here, then I'll be successful. It's, some, it's the some days and the if lens. Yeah. Be careful. Be careful. So what's the solution? Commit to a process. Wake up. Commit to a process. Here's what's so awesome about committing to a process and not a goal. Every single, are we going to hit that process every day? No. But can we pick up tomorrow and hit the process? Mm -hmm. See, it's about incremental growth and, and, and process and, and achievement day in, day out. We're not, putting, right, we're not putting happiness in the future. We're putting happiness now as we're following a system. Issue number two, goals, they are oddly, right, they, they are strangely at odds with long-term progress. Why? Why are goals not great for long-term progress? They have to be changed and adjusted. Yeah, whether you hit them or you don't hit them, you often stop when and if you do. Think about the marathon runner. I have yet to see a marathon runner cross the finish line and say, you know what, I'm going to go for a couple more miles. I just feel really good right now. I'm in flow. I'll catch up with you in about three. No, they cross the finish line and do what? Stop, like instantaneously, some fall. Like, believe me, I've been there. I'm not running another mile. The goal was reached, done. In fact, if any of you had trained for the marathon, I guarantee you, like, I think the statistic is 83% of marathon runners never run another one. Wow. So what was it? They, it wasn't a system for them. It was a goal. Now, congratulations, they hit a goal, but it didn't change their world, did it? Goal achieved, milestone reached, but it, it wasn't a system for them. It wasn't, a, it, was, it wasn't about health. At times, strangely at odds with long-term progress. And number three, Goals suggest that we control things that clearly we just don't have control over. <laughs> you know, I think about goals that were set um, by our partners in Houston this year. Did they have control over that goal ultimately <coughs> this past year? No. no, a hurricane had other plans for them. Yeah. But here's what I will tell you, and, and this, this is what made me really start thinking about this. We had a, we had a partner in Houston, many of you know Alex Frank. He, he actually founded um, KW Professionals uh, with the group. And um, you know he was, he was pushing hard towards a goal, and then the hurricane hit. And you know he said um, what got him through that period, uh, he took how, how long, how many months off? Two whole months off wow. just volunteering down there and, and, and being at the warehouse and helping out and we all went down and helped him out too and it was awesome and he said you know the one thing that 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 got me through is I have this thing called a lead generation lever and an assignment and a commitment to do a certain activity he was following a system guys and it was a system that kept going his goal in his mind was out the window like I'm not gonna hit my goal right because like, the hurricane said so. He didn't control that. He couldn't control that. Yet he followed his system, and guess what? Like, uh, within $100 of goal at the end of 2017, 
And he said, shoot, it's the system. So does our business have that system? Is our business a system or is it a bunch of goals? Solution, build feedback loops. See, he had a feedback loop. He could see if he was winning or losing, not based on his goal, but based on his activities. If our business doesn't have feedback loops along the way, feedback loops for the systems, feedback loops for the, for the progress, knowing where are we winning, where am I losing? See, if we're focused on the process, can you adjust? Yeah, if we're focused on the goal, well, at the end of the year, we look back and say, oh, didn't hit it this year, guess what? What do we do? We blow up the team and do it again. Oh, um, maybe next year. Goals versus systems. I will tell you, if, 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 if that's the one thing we take away from today's session, we all win. We all win. And here's why. Because what you're going to see is, uh, I break our business down into three main areas. We're not gonna talk specifically about four models today. Um, well, we will, but, but I've broken this down into three main areas of, of business growth, of building a business to expand off of, whether it's expanding in production, expanding in income, expanding in leadership, expanding across the country. The first part is operations. We have to realize that we are an operations-based industry and a business. We convince ourselves that we're a sales business. Why? Because that's where the money that's comes from. That's what's get, that is what gets us paid. That's how we make money. We sell real estate. Yet we sell something in our business, but our business is a systems, models, and tools business. Our, our business is a systems, models, and tools business. So we think, man, I'm gonna find the greatest buyer's agent, the greatest listing agent, I'm gonna be the best real estate agent, and honestly, you're overlooking an incredibly important part of our business, our director of operations, our operational team, our administrative team is probably the most valuable part of your business you could possibly have. Are there any ops people in the room? Someone is going to ask for a raise later. <laughs> I will be the first person to say we do not value these human beings enough and the importance in our business because when this, when this was internalized, in my world, it began to change. In fact, the day that I find, like we are, we are, we are career visioning a, a, a lot of people right now, but, but the two that I am ridiculously excited about that I believe will change our world dramatically have nothing to do with sales. They're both operational and they're amazing and I'm super excited. Why? Because I am very convinced and I know for a fact that it is a systems tools and models business. Now, who in the room says, hey, I'm amazing at that. I'm amazing at systems, I'm amazing at tools, I'm amazing at models, I'm amazing at roles, I'm amazing at accountability. <sighs> Not most of us, or any of us, by show of hands. Like, we're, we may, that just may not be who we are. In fact, most real estate agents aren't awesome at this, so where's our weakness? Administrative. Oh, right there. There's a quote in MREA. Um, on page 159, and, and when, I, when I read this again and again and again, and I realized how important it was, Gary said, designing and implementing systems take more time than you think and very specific skills. Okay, all right, I get that. Creating effective systems can be as complicated as it is time consuming, and many, many agents become frustrated. Who's been there? All of us. We all get frustrated with systems and models. So then what do we do? Statement. Frustration then leads to poor systems or no systems at all. That is our life. We either have poor systems or no systems at all. And, and the gap between you and ridiculous success, I would venture to guess, is operations. It typically is. Do we need to skill up? Sure. Can we change our approach? Sure but it's our operational talent. It's our operational systems and models and tools. In fact, leverage is a funny conversation, right? If we went to the op organizational model MREA, um, we, we, we hear leverage and what do we think? The word Agents. leverage. People, right? Like leverage, people, leverage, people. You know that's the third type of leverage in your business? Systems. The first is systems and tools. Mm -hmm. Systems, tools, then people systems, tools, then people. See, we can, if you say, well, I don't want a big organization filled with people, guess what? You can accomplish a lot more tomorrow than today if you just had systems and tools. So how important is that? Yeah. It's everything. It's everything in our business. Uh, there's, a, there's a section in our MREA called Leadership D and Business D. Who remembers this section? 
-hmm. Not many people. And, and that's okay. I didn't catch it until probably the sixth or seventh time that I was reading it. Leadership D, Business D, page 169. And this is what Gary says. Um, who are you in your business, typically? Business until you become everybody. CEO, tax. Yeah, you know. you're everybody. But I would say most of us will show up as the leadership, right? We 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 eventually will, or we should be on the path of showing up as the leader of our organization for most of the people in the room. That's leadership D. Leadership D gets things done, right? In MREA page 169, 170, 171, he says leadership D <coughs> is the drive of our business. It gets things done. It moves things forward, right? When you're there, when you show up, do. You, do things happen? Yes. Yes, you are the leadership D. Business D is the systems and models that ultimately run your business such that when you step away from your business, it still runs. See, we focus on leadership D, but if we don't have business D, right, business drive, then when you're, when you're not there, what happens? Nothing. One of the greatest things a coach had me do um, early on, and, and actually I, I thank this coach um, so much for this very great advice, and it was, uh, it was scary advice. And John, uh, you were in the organization. Uh, John's our director of sales in our organization, runs our, our Portland uh, team as well. But um, one of the things that my coach had me do is you need to leave. You just need to go away. You need to go away and see what breaks. And that was not a good thing for my personality. I mean, I am the guy that was prior to that ridiculously connected, right? Phone, email, everything. So I get this great idea that I'm gonna go to Costa Rica. And and I'm when I do something, I'm all in, right? It's not like, you know, a little bit, it's, it's that's why I don't gamble. Um, <laughs> that would be a problem. Uh, it's compulsive, um, somewhat obsessive, ask my wife. And, um, we just, I'm deciding we're gonna to go to Costa Rica. So we go to Tambor. Anyone been to Costa Rica? Ah, it's a beautiful country. We need to get more of you down there. Um, but we went to Tambor, which is in the southern tip of the Nicoya Peninsula. I had never been, uh, no I had. I had been there um, for three days to look at a hotel for a client. Um, but didn't really understand what I was getting into when I signed up for six weeks in Tambor. Um, I didn't have a phone. That was, that was a choice. No phone, six weeks. A business that was operating at, the, at that time um, already netting a million dollars. So clearly running, but I had never been away like that before. But I was told I had internet, and I said, okay, I could, I could deal with that. Um, internet was dial-up <laughs> at a local hotel that I was not staying at. And so I drove, right, day two to the, to the, to the hotel in Tambor. I brought my laptop, plugged it in, and the minute you hear, you're like, no way. <laughs> like, this is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the only time I plugged in. So here's what happened. That is the one way to find out whether or not your business has leadership D and just leadership D or leadership D and business D. Because I was July and I forget the year, I'm terrible with years, but it was the best month that we had that year and I wasn't there for six weeks. That told me, that told me something. John, you were there, so thank you. That told me something. Now, did things break? Oh yeah, lots of stuff broke. We had some person, we had a, we had a, a very nice lady who quit and hired herself back in those six weeks. We had, we had all heck break loose in those six weeks. Now, I wasn't there, but when I got back, guess what? The business was there. There was things to fix. I realized where there was leadership D and where there wasn't and where there needed to be some more. I also realized the importance of business D. But for the first time, I realized that, man, there are two types of leadership in our organization. And if we don't have business D, if no one shows up with business D, then you will always be a real estate agent. Cool? Ah, so what's the big D? Okay, so operations, right? It is, a, it is one of the three pillars of our business. The second pillar is lead generation and sales. Lead generation and sales. And interestingly enough, we're gonna show you the, the new organizational model in a bit in MREA2, um, uh, depending what year that comes out. But um, <laughs> the, we're gonna show you the new organizational model and you'll see where, where our path is going down this conversation. But lead generation and sales, is that important in our business? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the second thing I talk about though. What is lead generation? Generating business. 
Yeah, what's so interesting to me is oftentimes, like our company has done such a phenomenal job at talking about lead gen, right? We, I mean, do we not talk about, do we talk about anything else but lead gen? <laughs> I, I will tell you, it started a few years ago, and there's like one hour a day, lead gen one hour a day, somehow that morphed and rolled into two hours a day, two hours a day of lead gen turned into three, three hours a day, yeah, three hour day. days of lead, Three hours a day of Legion. Like, we are like, I think we're at six. We're like at <laughs> six or 10 hours. Of, like, we talk about Legion until, like, I just, like, oh my gosh. But, but that's activity. What we don't talk enough about is the lead generation model. You see, if all we do is talk about activity, guess what we're going to always do? Activity. We're gonna show up, look for a meal today, and go back tomorrow, and look for a meal, and go back the next day, and look for a meal. What we don't talk enough about is, is my activity a model? Can it be replicated? Can it be duplicated? Can it be leveraged? Uh, something hit home for me, and this sort of changed the trajectory of how we were building our business. Um, early on, we had uh, success in open houses, right? Um, I became that sort of the open house guy. In fact, I have not, from that day, and this is what? Seven years ago, I have not gone to family reunion without doing an open house session. Um, to the point where I began to think, man, I am like Ben Stiller. Uh, maybe, maybe, has he done a good, like, serious role? <laughs> Probably not. I don't watch movies, so I shouldn't use pop culture references. Like <laughs> but but you know that comedic actor that they that they're awesome at comedies, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm gonna do a serious role. And everyone's like, oh, just just go back to comedies. Like I was like, I'm that guy. I'm like the open house guy. Well, they won't let me do anything else but open houses. But here's what Gary said to me early on on stage at Mega Camp after we had done about 20 million in volume from open houses. He said, this is awesome, Chris. But can I can I challenge you on something? He said, you can only do so many. You can only do so many, right? I don't care how many you're doing, Chris, at a certain point, and you're doing a lot, and you're having great success, but at a certain point in time, can you do one a day, two a day? Could you do three a day? Congratulations, you can do 21 a week. You're still gonna hit a cap, right? Your business is capped based on this. Go back and figure out how to replicate it, duplicate it, and leverage it. And that was a challenge, and so we did. Right? We made the open house replicatable, right? We made it leverageable, right? We made it expandable. And now what's interesting, in a way, go back to that map, every week I have open houses in about 11 different states and two different countries in like 26 different cities. Interesting, right? It's a different way to think. But is it an activity or is it a model? And that's where even at Family Reunion this year, Gary and I talked about lead generation levers. So we're going to talk about levers too. Um, this this quote uh, we actually should we should address this before we move forward. Um, this is probably the age old conversation when it comes to leads, right? Like some people will argue to the death that man, it is all about lead count. It's about how many leads I get. I just need more of them. It's a, it's a count thing. And other people are like, you're an idiot. Like it's all about lead quality. Like I don't want a lot of leads. I just want, right? I just want really good people. People that know me, that I'm deep in relationship with. I just need, I just need quality leads. Well, Gary's clear and says, listen, it, I mean, you need both, right? You need to go deep. Right, which is the well mentality of the database, but you also need to go wide, which is the net mentality of the database. But if you're only going to choose one, which would you choose? Quality. Quality. Ah, again, systems and goals, and this is great. Here's the deal. Um, page 135 of that Marie, Gary says this. The octane of your fuel is irrelevant if you don't have enough to get to your destination. The octane of your fuel is irrelevant. Who's ever run out of gas? It's okay, I have. Fewer than most. You must have a lot of gas stations in Vegas. Uh, if you've ever run out of gas, right, at that moment, I remember the first and only time I did, I was in New York, uh, I was driving a pickup truck. It's a completely different story. Um, and I ran out of gas. I promise you, I did not think, you know what, I put in the 86 grade, and if I just put in 89, I would have. No, I literally thought, why the heck do I not have a gallon of gas in my tank? It wasn't about quality. The octane was irrelevant. It was all about the quantity. Leads are no different, guys. That may not be what we want to hear, but guess what shows up when quantity increases? Quality. 
Now, do you want to work with quality leads? Yeah, I want to work with quality leads all day, every day, but I know I better have a lever and a system and a, and a model to generate a lot of leads that filters out those quality, that quality. So we're going to go through this. We're going to go through building our lead generation lever. Uh, this is something I talked briefly about um, with Gary at Family Reunion, but I would say this. I'm going, to, I'm going to take you through our philosophy on a lever with the goal of you being able to apply this to any lever, right? We're not gonna talk specifically about, well, should it be FISBOs or should it be expired? So Chris, talk to me about your open house class. Happy to do that, we just don't have time. But what I wanna do is show you the formula of any lead generation lever that we use in our organization that we've used to expand across the country. I call them our six P's of, of lead gen. The first one is psyche, which is a, a just, it's another word for mindset. And I often say I would have used mindset, but then it would have been like five P's and an M, and it's just not snappy. <laughs> so it's psyche. It's what is my mindset as I show up. Like we have to get our mindset right about why we're there doing that activity. Oftentimes, that's already messed up. Right, the open house, I'm there because my seller wants me to be. The open house, I'm there to find a buyer, right, for this home or for another home. The open, our mindset always is database. Understand any activity we are doing, it is to build the database. That is our business. It's a future buyer, future seller, immediate buyer, immediate seller, right? Everybody in our database, everyone we meet is one of those four people, and that's my mindset. That is my psyche around an lead gen. Why? Because if you walk in or I call you and you don't own a home, you will one day. I am, I'm convinced of it, that's my mission. Because I believe that home ownership brings generational wealth and I want you to have that. So if you don't own a home, you will. If you're not a seller, but you own a home, one day you will be, right? One day, and some seller, no, nope, not me, I'm here until I die, great, and my business will be too. So whether, whether you're an immediate seller or, or we will sell it, right? And, 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 and pass along the money to your kids. I'm good with that. Future buyer, future seller, immediate buyer. Is there any other type of person? <laughs> psyche. It's the psyche. It's the, it is a mindset of our lead generation levers. We start there and guess what? We coach around it, we consult around it, we collaborate around it in our organization, but it's a critical part that we often miss. Second P, preparation. Now, this is the problem, right? Uh, well, we have a lot of problems. It should be the seventh P, just problems. Um, <laughs> preparation is difficult because we just never set the time to do it. In fact, part of the issue is that we jump in and start making money too quick, right? How, how many got their real estate license in 60 days or less? 30 days? Yeah, I mean, anyone get their real estate license in less than 30 days? Mm -hmm. And guess what happens? Like 30 days later, you go out and guess what? Go find a buyer and a seller. And some of us, you, some of us get lucky and we find a buyer, we find a seller. And 45, 60 days